Hello everybody and welcome back to Analysis ML tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about collision detection and collision response. First of all, what is collision detection? Collision detection is checking whether or not an object is inside of another object. This is really important because otherwise we do not know whether our players, for instance, colliding with an enemy's sword or, or something like that. And what is collision response? Collision response is actually pushing two objects outside of each other. So if two objects are colliding with each other, then we need to somehow push them outside of each other again. So you, for instance, do not fall through the floor. So that's what collision response is for. Collision response resolves this issue. Now that we know what collision detection is and what collision response is, how do we actually, yeah, <laughs> do it? Well, we first need to know what type of collision detection we're going to do. We're going to do AABB collision detection, which stands for Axis Aligned Bounding Boxes. This means that we can only have cubes that are not rotated colliding with each other. As soon as one of them is rotated, yeah, it will still be a, a normal box. So even if we have our square and it's rotated like this, it will create a box like that out of it. It will only do collision with boxes that are on the same axis of each other. In order to solve that problem, you have something called SAT, for instance, uh, which stands for separating axis theorem, but that's a bit out of the scope for this tutorial series. Okay, let's now look at an example. First of all, we have two different cubes here. Now we're going to need a few different things from these cubes. The first thing that we're going to need is the center position. So the position of the center of the cube. As you will see, this cube has a center position of 6, 6, and this cube has a center position of 37, 22. The next thing that we'll need is the half size, so half the size of the cube from the center position. These cubes are both 10 by 10, so the half size will be 5 by 5. The reason that it needs to be the half size is because it needs to be the size from the center position to any of the corners. And the half size gives us this distance. So if this cube will be 10 by 5, then the half size will be 5 by 2.5. The next thing that we'll need is the delta between the two centers of the cubes. It's really important that we do it from the center of the cubes and not of the nearest corner, since we want to be able to do some calculations with it. So the delta between these two centers is 31 and 16. So 31 cubes to the right and 16 cubes down from the top left square. The next thing that we'll need to do is do the actual calculation on whether or not they're intersecting. How we do that is we take the absolute value of the delta and then we minus both of the half sizes. And then we'll get two different numbers. So one for the x-axis and one for the y-axis. And if they're positive, then that means that they're outside of it. But if they're negative, then we know that they're inside of each other. So let's take this example. We have 5, 5 and 5, 5 of half sizes. So in total, it's 10. It's 10 on the x-axis and 10 on the y-axis. So if we take the absolute value of this delta, it's always going to be within a 90 degree angle. Even if the delta would be negative 31 by negative 16, then taking the positive value would put it in this direction. And if one of them would be negative, so it would normally be in that direction, yeah, then taking the absolute values off of it will still make it point in that direction. So that way we have a 90 degree angle that we need to worry about. And what we can do is we can project a cube here. We can project a cube here and then check whether that delta, so in this case it's over here, whether that delta is inside of that cube. And the size of that cube is both of the half size together. So 5, 5 and 5, 5. So in this example, as you will see, if we take 5 and then uh, I think this is another 5, both in the width and the height, then you will see that the delta is outside of the cube so there is no collision. But if you go to the next example, then you will see that the delta is 8, 9. So if we make a cube from the center position of our first cube with a size of 10 by 10, then you will see that it will end up somewhere over here. And so the delta, this delta here, is inside of the cube. So they're colliding. As you will also see inside of the calculation. So what we do is we take the absolute value, so 8 and 9, and then we minus both of the half sizes combined. So 8 minus between brackets 5 plus 5, which gives us negative 2. And 9 minus between brackets 5 plus 5 gives us negative 1. So we know that, that it's colliding because both the x and the y are negative. So now that we know the theory, it's time to implement it. The first thing that we'll need is some sort of collision class. So let's create that. Add class C++ class. It's called collision. And what this class will need is only one thing. It needs an, uh, well, let's first include SFML graphics at HPP. It just needs one thing. It needs a SF rectangle shape and called body. The reason that we're storing the body inside of the class collision is because we want to be able to modify it. We could also just store the half size and store the position, but then we wouldn't be able to push the body out. So we'd only be able to check the collision and resolve it. This might be what you want to go for, but if you also want to resolve it, you either have to make something external for that, or you have to give it a reference to the body. So this constructor will also need an SF rectangle shape and called body. Okay, then there are a few functions that we'll need. The first function is, of course, a boolean called check collision. 
Check collision. And this will need another collision. And called other. And the second thing that we'll need is a float. Let's just call it push. Basically, what this float will be, and if you have a better name for it, please <laughs> put it in the comments. I have no idea what to call this. But basically, what this float will do is decide how much each object needs to be pushed out. So if it's zero, then this object will be completely pushed out of the other object. So this object will move. But when it's one, the other object will move away. So uh, for instance, if we have a wall, we want it to be zero, since yeah, the player should not be able to move through the wall. But if we have a crate, for instance, that is really light, then we want push to be one, because we want to be able to push that light crate. But if we put it at 0 0.5, then you will see that it's sort of a heavy crate. So that's what this push variable does. Okay, now there are a few more functions that we'll need. Uh, one of the functions is uh, returns an SF vector 2f, and it's called get position. The reason that we make a function for this is because you want to be able to get the position of the other inside of the check collision function. So this just needs to return body.get position. The next thing that we'll need is an SF vector 2f called get half size. And this needs to return. Oh, I forgot return here. This needs to return body.getSize divided by 2.0f. Okay, then there's one more function that we need. It's going to be a void called move. And what this function will need is a float called dx, which stands for delta x, and it needs a float called dy or delta y. And then it will call the body that move function with dx and dy. The reason that we make a function for this is so we do not have to make body a public variable. That's also why we have the other two getter functions. Okay, so let's create this function, check collision, and let's copy this and put it inside of the constructor. And in the constructor, you will see that it will complain. It will give us an error. It will say collision, collision as a rectangle shape and body provides no initializer for reference member collision body. So what we need to do is we need to use an initializer list. If you still remember what it is, you need to use a, a column and then you need to type in the member variable name. So in this case, body. And then you need to type in the attribute name. So whatever's passed in the name of that. So in this case, also body. And do not put a semicolon at the end. It's really important. And that's basically it. So let's now create a check collision function. So let's go there. And this actually needs to return false at the end because uh, it will reach the end when there's no collision happening. The first thing that we'll need is we need to get the half size and the position of both this and the other. So an SF vector 2f called other position is equal to other dot get position. Another SF vector 2f called other half size is equal to other dot get half size. Okay, then we can copy these two and simply remove other and a dot and change other to this this okay and that's all we need now it's time to do the actual collision detection so the first thing that we're going to need is the delta x and the delta y if you remember this is one of the necessary things for the collision detection is getting a delta between both of them and since we're using absolute values for a calculation we do not need to worry about from what perspective we're doing the calculations so even if we're doing it from the other side so we'll use rectangle 2 as the first rectangle and rectangle 1 as the second rectangle then we would still use the absolute value of it so it would still be 31 16 even though it's the other way around originally okay so we're going to need a float called delta x and we're going to set it equal to other position dot x minus this position dot x. We're going to need to do the same for delta y. Okay, now it's time to do the intersection calculation. So let's create a variable called intersect x and intersect y. And we'll basically do this calculation in there. So the absolute value of the delta minus half size of 1 plus half size of 2. We do that for both x and y. So float intersect x is equal to the absolute value, so abs, of delta x minus, between brackets, other half size that x plus this half size that x. Okay, now we can copy this, but make sure that you actually replace all of the x's with y's. Uh, it's one saying on my study, <laughs> copy and paste is the devil, and so I always do it. <laughs> So this is basically all the code that we need for the checking if two objects are intersect with each other. So to do the collision detection, the only thing that we need now is an if statement to check if they're actually colliding. So if intersect.x is less than 0, that's 0f, and intersect y is less than 0, that's 0f, then we're colliding. So then we can return true. 
The reason that uh, I made it a boolean, even though we do the collision resolving in here, is because sometimes you need to know if two things are colliding. For instance, when you uh, have a finish of a level, you need to know if the player is colliding with that finish. If you have an enemy bullet, you need to know if the player is colliding with that bullet. And that's why we're returning a boolean here. Okay, so now we know whether we are colliding with something and now we need to make sure that our push variable is within the range of 0 to 1 because if it's outside of the range of 0 to 1 then we're gonna do some multiplication which will make it so an object get pushed out twice as much for instance and it will be really weird. Believe me, I experimented with it. So we're gonna have to do push is equal to the std min std max version of push 0 to 0 f and then here 1.0f. What this will do is it will clamp the push position to 0 to 1. So what this first thing will do, std max push 0 will take the maximum value of push, so whatever value it may be, and 0. And then what std min, uh, std max push 0 and 1 will do, is it will take whatever that returns, so either push or 0, and then check what the minimum value is of that and 1. So this way it will be, be uh, will be between 0 and 1. And you call this process clamping. So clamping something between value 1 and value 2. The next thing that we need to do is to check which intersection is bigger since we want to take the smallest intersection. Since it might be, like in this example, that yeah, we're intersecting on two things since that's actually necessary, but we only want to push out this part. We don't want to push it out this way because yeah, that, that's weird, that should, not, ne that should never happen. So that's why we need to check which is the smallest value and yeah, because we're using negative values, we need to take the biggest one. So if intersect x is bigger than intersect y, which is uh, the same as uh, using absolute value here and then changing that to min. So this is exactly the same. The absolute value of intersect x is less than the absolute value of intersect y, but because we're using negative numbers, uh, we have to flip it around. That will mean that we need to push it out somewhere on the x-axis, else we have to push it out on the y-axis. So in here, we need to have a check to check whether or not our delta x is negative or positive, so in which direction we need to push it out. So if delta x is bigger than 0 to 0 f, then we'll have to move this, so move this uh, with intersect x multiplied by 1 to f minus push, and then 0 to 0 f on the y-axis. Okay, and then we have to type in other dot move minus intersect x multiplied by push 0 to 0 f. The reason that we're using negative intersect x is because we want the other object to be moved out in the other direction. Because yeah, if we have two different objects and they're intersecting, then this object needs to be pushed out in that direction and this object needs to be pushed out in this direction. If we do not do that, then yeah, they will be po both pushed into the same direction and the collision will stay. Okay, then we need to do an else. And then we basically need to do this, but the other way around. So let's just copy it and then change this to negative intersect x and this to positive inter uh, intersect x. Okay, and now we can copy this, but make sure to change all of the x's to y. This is really important. Remember, copying and pasting is the devil. <laughs> and then we also need to remove this 0 to 0 f. The reason that I'm just copying it is because we literally need to do the same thing but on the y-axis. So yeah, it's basically rewriting something that you've already done. Okay, now that we have that, we have all of the actual collision code done. So the only thing that we need to do now is to create a class that actually uses the collider and make sure that the player also is able to give us a collider. So let's do that first. So we first have to include collider, or collision, sorry. We should really call it a collider actually. And that's that. That's a worry about that. Collision works too. So it needs to return a collision, and let's call it get collision. Now let's let's rename it to collider. Actually, it's a bad practice to have something with a wrong name. So if we go to the class name, we can cl uh, click on rename and then change collision to collider, and that would change everything to collider. So whenever you use collision, it would change it to collider. It's also something pretty cool to know. So we're going to change this to collider2 and then rename the name to collider. And then in player.h, we're also going to change it to collider. Okay, get collider. And that will return collider with body. And that's it. This is basically everything that we need to change inside of the player. Oh, collision.h needs to be changed to collider.h. Okay. Oh no, actually, we need to do one more thing in the player. Uh, in order to make the demo a bit easier, 
we're going to make it so you can also move the player in the uh, up and down. So just copy this, change A to W, and change D to S, and then make sure that this is Y instead of X. Okay, now our player is completely done, so now it's time to create another class that uses a collider. So let's call this class platform. And what this platform will have is uh, a private as of rectangle shape called body. And uh, of course, I need to include as a female graphics.hpp. And then the constructor will need a few things. The constructor, of course, needs an SF texture, a pointer called texture, just like the player does, since we want to be able to texture this platform. It will need an SF vector 2f called size, since you want to uh, want this platform to have a size, and an SF vector 2f called position. We'll need an SF render window. And it's actually going to be exactly the same as the function from the player. And then the second thing is also a function that a player has. It's going to return a collider. And it's going to be called get collider. Then we'll return a collider with body. Okay, so in order to do that, we also need to include collider. Okay, and that's it. That's everything that this class needs to do for now. So let's create these functions. Let's be sure that we call window.draw in here with body. And then here we need to make sure that we put in all the variables. And then we simply need to put in body.set size. To size body dot set texture to texture and body dot set position to position but that's not actually all if you might remember we need a center position so we also need to set the origin you can do it without setting the origin but that will mean that you will have to not set the origin of all objects as soon as you set one origin you will have to set all of them otherwise the collision will be all messed up so since we already set an origin we're going to do it for this too set origin to the half of the size of the body okay and that's it so now on main.cpp let's create two different platforms so first of all include platform and then let's create two of them so a platform a platform one and it's going to get the player texture or let's actually give it a no pointer so no texture, so it will be a solid white color. Uh, then an SF vector 2F for the size. Let's make it 400 in the x-axis and 200 in the y-axis. And then when it comes to position, let's put it at 500, 200. Okay, let's copy this. Change this to 0.0F. 0 0 put this to 2. Then it's time to draw them. So platform 1, the draw with window. Okay, let's copy that change this to platform 2 and now it's time to do the collision detection there's one thing that we need to make sure that we do and that is that we set the view at the end because we do have to do the collision detection after the update but also after we set the center of the view then we will still get the jittery so whenever the player is not able to walk through a wall then it will jitter because yeah it will be pushed back and it will be weird so we need to make sure that we set the center after we do the collision detection but we also need to make sure that we update the player before we do the collision detection because otherwise we yeah we're gonna have the same jitter but then because the player is moving after we do the collision detection so in order to do the collision detection actually we have to type in uh let's do platform one dot get collider dot check collision with player dot get collider and then we also need to give it a push so the first one is going to be 0.0f 0 0 and then we simply copy this change this to 1 and then change the platform to 2 and now if we run the program you will see that we have a big white square here and if we move then you can see that we can push one of the white squares away but the other one yeah we will we cannot move through it and it's also working on the sides we cannot move through it on the sides but we can move this one down and actually, if we change, uh, for instance, this one to 0 to 5f instead of 0, then you will see that we suddenly move really slowly whenever we push it. We move way slower than we do normally. That's because 50% is pushed back on us and 50% is pushed back on that object. So if we change this to 0.9f, for instance, so it's a really heavy crate, then you will see that it will take a lot of force in order to move this object. So that's basically all I want to talk about in this episode. I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.